lying, thinking last night, how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone. I came up with one thing and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen, there are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their wives run around like banshees, their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone, but nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering, the wind is gonna blow, the human race is suffering, and I can hear the moan because nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. An excerpt from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon delivered on April 4th, 1967 at Riverside Church. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the word world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and the justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we're called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will be only an initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It's not a haphazard and superficial. Compassion sees that an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. Good evening to you all. I'm here before you in this moment to welcome you to the 44th annual MLK lecture at CST. And, and in doing that, I first want to say how grateful I am for all those who will be leading us in this hour. Our thanks goes to CST Doctor of Ministry student Farah Shakur Bridges, CST President Jeffrey Kwan, CST Doctor of Philosophy student Dillis Brooks, Dr. Kirsten O, oh, professor at Azusa Pacific University, Dr. Nicholas Greer, my CST faculty colleague, PhD students and staff members, Hunjay Lee and Taehoon Lee, who work behind the scenes to keep our technology on track. And of course, Dr. Phyllis Isabella Shepard, our speaker of the hour. 
And I'm also grateful for my CSD colleague, Professor Lincoln Galloway, who's fashioned this event and has drawn us together at this time. When I asked Dr. Galloway what could possibly suffice as a welcome for such a time as this, he offered me a quote from one of Dr. King's books published in 1967 entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? In his book, Dr. King writes, we have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture and interest, who because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live together with each other in peace. Dr. Galloway told me that he believes, as I do, that we at CST have chosen the path that leads to the beloved community of belonging that Dr. King described. That's what we as aspire to. We too have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we live, learn, teach, and work together to heal and transform the world. Our students come from around the globe and across spiritual and cultural traditions. So in this spirit of community, I welcome you all this evening to the 44th annual MLK lecture. Trustees, administrative staff, faculty, students, CST alums, spiritual leaders, colleagues from Pilgrim Place, members of religious and faith communities, friends of CST from around the world. A warm welcome to you all. May the spirit of undaunted, courageous compassion expressed by Dr. King flow through us all in these moments and beyond. Welcome. Each year around this time, Claremont School of Theology presents a series of events to honor the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The King Celebration at CST brings together faculty, staff, students with community leaders, activists, and pastors to discuss the significance of the ministry of Martin Luther King Jr to the African-American community, to diverse religious communities, and also to the nation and the world. Here at CST, the practice of observing MLK Day dates back to 1978, eight years before the National Day of Observance was put in place in 1986. During the early years, the lecture was listed as the King Convocation on the school's academic calendar. However, in 1993, the event became the Martin Luther King Jr. Endowed Lectureship established with a gift from Dr. David Bruce Rogers, son of Professor Cornish Rogers and his wife, Elsie Rogers. Tonight, we remember and reinvigorate the dialogue that was started by Preston M. Williams, who was the first lecturer and was the professor of theology and contemporary change at Harvard Divinity School, an editor at large of the Christian Century. CST has engaged in that dialogue with wise and inspirational conversation partners who span the spectrum of activists, community leaders, scholars, and prophetic preachers. Some of these include Reverend James Lawson, C. Eric Lincoln, Renita Weems, Emile Towns, Dolores Williams, Marcia Riggs, Dwight Hopkins, Anthony Penn, Karen Baker Fletcher, and our own Monica A. Coleman, and then last year, Brian Bantam. Tonight, we welcome Professor Phyllis Isabella Shepard to help us celebrate and honor the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Over the past few years, we have heard gut-wrenching cries for justice. We witnessed an insurrection. We hear disingenuous political discourse about critical race theory, and we continue to hear echoes of Dr. King's call to give us the vote. So in 2022, 
we search for answers, new directions, and glimmers of hope in our homes, in our places of worship, and in our theological institutions, such as our very own Claremont School of Theology. To all of you who have gathered here this evening, I say on behalf of all the student organizations and the entire CST community, we appreciate your presence and we thank you for being here and choosing to join the conversation in our MLK celebrations. Thank you, Ferrara. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, I would like to introduce to you Dillis Brooks, our PhD student, who will serve as the moderator of the conversation after our, our speaker presents her lecture. Dillis is the campus chaplain of Loma Linda University, where she provides spiritual care for the students, faculty, and staff. She is a PhD student here at CSD in our Practical Theology, Spiritual Care, and Counseling Program, and a student member of the CSD Board of Trustees. Thank you, Dillis, for joining us and moderating the conversation later. And now it is my distinct, uh, distinct honor to introduce to you Professor Phyllis Isabella Shepard. Professor Phyllis Isabella Shepard is the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Chair and Associate Professor of Religion, Psychology and Culture at Vanderbilt University Divinity School. Dr. Shepard is the inaugural director of the James Lawson Institute for Research and Study of Nonviolent Movements at Vanderbilt University. Prior to joining the Vanderbilt faculty, she was Associate Professor of Pastoral Psychology and Theology at Boston University School of Theology. She is a womanist ethnographer, ethnographer practical theologian and psychoanalyst. She is the author of two books, three books. The first, Self-Culture and Others in Womanist Practical Theology, places Black women's experience, self-psychology and womanist theology in a critical dialogue to articulate a womanist practical theology. In her second book, Tilling Sacred Ground, Interiority, Black Women and religion, Religious Experience. She examines the relationship between Black women's religious experience in public spaces and interiority. She argues that in religious space and spiritual practices, Black women negotiate race, gender, and sexuality, and as such, religion is complicated and, com and complex phenomena because of unconscious and conscious dimensions. Moving beyond brick and mortar sites of religion, Professor Shepard turns to art, cyberspace, ritual, and street ministry to examine public and interior religious motivations. Her third book, My Existence is My Resistance, Womanist Ethnography and Black Women's Vocation, 
argues that throughout Black women's vocational narratives is an interlocking pursuit for justice in their lives, communities, and society. Professor Shepard holds a PhD from the Chicago Theological Seminary in Theology, Ethics, and the Human Sciences, and earns certificates in psychoanalysis and community chaplaincy. Please help me welcome Professor Shepard as our 44th MLK lecturer. And the title of her lecture this evening is Rituals, Resistance and Love in the Struggle for Justice, a Womanist Meditation. Professor Shepard. Thank you, President Kwan. I thank the Claremont School of Theology's community, especially um, Professor Galloway, who has walked with me into this evening. Um, I thank the planning committee. I thank our preacher this evening. And I thank all of you who are here um, with us. Let me begin with this piece called Still Forming. We cannot become the loved community without dismantling rituals of hate, bitterness, and violence. We shall walk one holy step at a time, offering three deep bows to one another, lavish libations to the ancestors, giving thanks for the elders and joining hands with the brave and the tired young. Remember and name names, call them forth. Listen, listen, listen to what they know and what we have forgotten or never learned. Name names, commit to a more just, more loving, freer tomorrow. Start by looking around you. We become a whole and holy community together. Ritual spaces where black women are situated at the heart of the process are spaces where black women show up powerfully. Ritual is always about the presence and use of power. Alice Walker's definition of womanist describes how black women simultaneously embody cultural and spiritual power. Womanist Walker writes are serious, in charge, wanting to know more and in greater depth than is considered good. Many of us know that. Love music, love the moon, loves the spirit, loves love, food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, loves herself regardless. The more we hear about the attack on black bodies and black lives, we know that that loving ourselves regardless is a radical countercultural necessary move. Yes, black women want to know more, produce more religious spiritual and cultural knowledge through music, through noticing the lunar cycles, standing flat-footed in struggle and love, engaging the art of food preparation, practicing roots and seeing the signs. Black women open themselves up to the spirit to be let loose in the diaspora so that black people can be come a people who love their black selves into healing, wholeness, and a future. This requires the wisdom and spirits of the ancestors and a commitment to the present and a belief in a world we have not yet seen. Ritual processes are memory and reminders of the culture, the history, the religions and families that the forces of racism, colonialism, and spiritual imperialism 
have attempted to deny. Ritual sanctions our connections to the ancestors and their teachings when we are open to the complexity of existence. The Buddhist Lama Rod Owens captures this succinctly. He says, I have always felt touched by an unseen world, the world of ghosts, spirits, demons, and angels. These two worlds maintain a precious balance, continually rubbing up against each other. This feed in two worlds that Owen speaks of and calls rubbing up against each other can take shape and form in ritual spaces. Here and in the process, we hold the history of the community, both explicitly and implicitly. But this powerful holding space is not a given. Maladoma Salme argues that ritual is to awaken us, make us conscious of the unseen world. The unseen world is that which operates in the unconscious, of course, and in the conscious, in the unseen world. The unseen world is that that requires our awakening. We must be awakened to the unseen world that includes the systematic forces that affect our lives. Those forces that keep people oppressed but seem normal to those who benefit from oppression. Yes, I'm talking about racism, sexism, heterosexism, and the ways in which they shape the way we relate to one another, the ways they shape what we learn in our educational institutions, even what we choose to use in the process of educating. Both the oppressed and those reaping the benefits of ill-begotten gains must awaken. Consider Dr. King's view on the importance of crisis and tension when preparing those for nonviolent direct action. After city le leaders in Birmingham refused to come to the table to negotiate. Influenced by Gandhi's approach, he spoke, the, he spoke of the process of purification that needed to be undertaken. The organizers began this ritual process, I'm calling it a ritual process, a purification by developing workshops on nonviolence. He said, mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence and we repeatedly asked ourselves, the whole group, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? Those organizing for nonviolence had to be awakened through awareness of what was coming their way. And the questions being asked, are you able, repeatedly awakened them to the difficulties they would face and to their interior lives in need of transformation. Are you able, are you able, are you awakened to yourself and the world? But the city leaders who would be the source of the dangers ahead had to awaken as well. King by being confronted by the pra practices and strategies of nonviolence said, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is, to, is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as a part of the work of nonviolent resistance may sound rather shocking but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension, which is necessary for growth. Tension, awakening and ritual are inextricable. The capacity to see or be aware of the unseen world and how it operates 
is essential for the self and for social transformation. Ella Baker reminded us that it is not an elevated education or economic status that makes us aware or awaken. She argued, oppressed people, whatever their level of formal education, have the ability to understand and interpret the world around them, to see the world for what it is and move to transform it. Note that process. Oppressed people, whatever their level of education, have the ability to understand and interpret the world and move to transform it. And that transformation means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change the system. Ritual space is forming and transforming space, but it cannot be ideologically, theologically, or in practice be separated from social, economic, contextual realities. Linda Thomas, the, the womanist anthropologist and theologian in her study of healing ritual in South African indigenous churches found that, quote, rituals of healing blend worldviews of the pre-colonial past and the present symbols of colonizers religion to form a cosmology that helps one to live with everyday challenges. Ritual, she argues, helps because it prom promotes meaning in a crazy world. Such meaning making is tied to the spiritual as well as the material and social world. In other words, particularity matters, history matters, race, gender, sexuality, class, it all matters. One's social location matters. Our job is to know how they matter. How do they matter in our lives? How do they matter in our communities? We know that they take shape and form in the religious, political, and relational, relational domains. We need to pay attention to how they do this. What are the embodied and ritual ways in which they matter and work in our communal and individual lives? How do they work in the rituals of injustice and transformation? We ignore, ignore ritual process to our detriment and peril because reading the rituals of the day and paying attention helps us expose the oppressive dances masquerading as truth telling, masquerading as truth telling. I'd like to use a Hebrew text to get at that masquerading as truth telling. I will not read the whole text, but I'm referencing Ezekiel chapter 13, one through 14. It gives us a bit of an example. And this is the narrative where Ezekiel says, God came to me and said, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are now prophesying and saying to those who are to those who prophesy out of their own imagination. So these false prophets are going around saying, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign God says. You prophets of Israel, God responds, are like jackals among ruins. You have not gone up to the breaches in the wall to repair it for the people so that it will stand firm in the battle their visions are false. This is God saying their visions are false and their divinations a lie. Even though the Lord has not sent them, they say the Lord declares. And when you say the Lord declares, and I have not spoken, you say the Lord declares and I have not spoken. A couple things interest me about the text in light of ritual and the struggle for liberation. First, the God in this text sounds shocked, indignant. Though I have not spoken, prophecies abound, visions and futures are declared and promised. Do we not hear this? The integration, the intertwinement of false lies, politics, and spirituality, if 
we continue to listen to the news every day. The 13th chapter of, Ze of Ezekiel, the prophet is calling the people to take note, to be awakened to, to two important facts. The first is that there are foolish teachers out there, prophets who follow their own spirit, offer false teachings, false visions and lies as prophecies in the name of God. We have only to listen to the news, listen outside our front doors to know this is true. The second point Ezekiel makes draws on our attention to this, false prophecies abound and futures are promised to a receptive audience. Prophets do not announce visions and futures to an empty house. We are the people listening to their messages and sometimes with a shout, sometimes with a vote, we affirm them in ritual spaces. The challenge that Ezekiel's message exposes is that false prophets are called prophets because their lies, their visions, their promises are so convincing. Their visions are maddeningly seductive because they use the language of religion, hope, ritual and promise as the way to capture our imagination. Whitewashing, which the text speaks of, whitewashing is designed to whitewash our psyches so that we begin to repeat the lies that we hear as truth and identify with those who oppress. We hear this all the time. Some news story will be repeated over and over and again, before you know it, what we considered thinking people are now repeating the lie that says it happened because he didn't stop. It happened because the officer felt threatened. It happened because internalizing the lie, internalizing the prophecy. Franz Fanon would tell us, our minds and our lives are colonized through external and internal practices. Black skin, white mask should be read, of course, as a psychology of oppression, but also as a discussion of the whitewashing ritual practices of colonization. Whitewashed walls are not wood or concrete. In fact, most are not, they are rhetorical in public prayers and devotions, and they intrude our spiritualities. False prophets and their narratives tell us who is inside and who is outside, the spaces of welcome and inclusion. Just as rituals can inflict damage in the most intimate dimensions, dimensions of community life, they can also create communities of healing spaces but we must be critical of ritual. In his study on rituals and healing in African-American spiritual churches, Claude F. Jacobs reports that spiritual ministers place emphasis on the transformation of the mind and the congregants view of the self as the cause of the problem. In other words, it's inside, it's totally interior. This directs their diagnoses, their rituals, and their use of ritual objects. He reports that the spiritual ministers he encountered did not believe that ritual objects or ritual action had the power to change people, but insisted that their problems are in the mind. People who believe they are hoodooed actually are hoodooed, and the work of the spiritual minister is to change such thoughts. Maladoma Somme, directs us to the interiority of suffering. He says, for the Dagara people and for the Dagara elder, pain is the result of a resistance to something new, to something new. Pain therefore is our body complaining about an intruder. It is possible then to say in a misguided way that pain is good, primarily because it is a call to growth. While Jacob's description of spiritual ministers and Somme's understanding of pain 
argue that a problem, that problems are interior and a cognitive transformation is required along with ritual for relief, they also confirm, confirm that it is a ritual means for interrogating negative, disempowering messages that we've internalized. So on the one hand, they say the problem's inside, but they rightly say that what the problem is needs to be interrogated. Ritual helps us interrogate what womanist ethnic, ethicist Emily M. Towns calls hegemonic imagination. Those negative messages that society reproduces across generations to sustain white supremacy and to convince all who are not white, male, heterosexual, educated, physically able to access most buildings and loans to own homes and buildings, that we are flawed, that systems of injustice work. In other words, the hegemonic imagination, if it gets inside of us, makes us think that systems of injustice work. And again, that we are the problem. Ritual awakens us to the breadth and depth of the lie that keeps everyone in their place. Notice, ritual requires us to take notice of our bodies and our social historical location. It awakens us and announces change. What does this look like? Well, I'm a practical theologian, ethnographer, and a psychoanalyst, so of course I have a case. And I'll share my screen just briefly so that we might hear a little bit from Janelle Monet. Monet's video was created for the documentary, All In, The Fight for Democracy, marking Stacey Abrams' rise in political significance in the Georgia election and how the election was stolen from her. Monet prophesizes the turning of the tables on white supremacy. In characteristic, bold, and creative style, she presages an end to black suppression, cultural dismemberment, and oppressive images of beauty. The video is replete with scenes of black African-inspired culture, hair, art, acts of public resistance, everyday workers, history, and intergenerational relationships. One scene, a young black girl sits facing two dolls, one black and one white. She chooses the black doll. This scene revisits the historical doll test researchers, excuse me, undertaken by um, psychologists, Kenneth and Mamie Cole, and points to the transformed black interiors re-identification with one's own black self as good, desirable, and beautiful. The most powerful moment at the end of the video, Monet pulls a large statue of Majaya from the ocean. Yamaya of the African Yoruba religion, Condomble in Brazil, Vadun in Haiti, Santeria in Cuba, and other places, is the mother of the Orishas and the Orisha of the sea. Yamaya, also referred to as Yamanja, is an Orisha venerated and, tra and traveled with Africans forced into transport from Nigeria to Brazil, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the United States during the slave trade. She continued to be venerated in ritual and religious ceremonies, often, of the gu often under the guise of Christian saints. When Monet finally pulls the statue so that it makes its full appearance, we see the rich ritual and the inner spiritual recovery work we must engage in to turn this unjust world and ourselves around. Milke Smith Amari Takara says that rituals in this religious worldview 
are dynamic political entities in the sense that they operate as centers of cultural resistance and power. Ritual expresses and pulls together multiple multi-layered public and historical meanings that become operative during the ritual process. In the video, Monet is enacting what Joni L. Jones describes as the Orisha. Jones argues that Orishas, Orishas are inherently diasporic and context shaped because, quote, in fact, they want to adapt to each reason, each region's needs so that they can extend their power and reach. This quality, quality of contextualization and mobility means that they travel with those who were stolen and sold into slavery in the West and surrounded them in that experience. Furthermore, the Orishas, when they come through local aesthetic sounds, images. We hear them in such things as spoken word, music, dance, drumming, chanting. All are employed as needed. This is what ritual teaches us, that ritual is emergent, it's contextual. It gives us the urgently needed stability to, to those who have to reroute the legacy of enslavement and oppression. But this rerouting of ritual cannot be presumed. As powerful as the image of Monet pulling Yama from the ocean, Black women's recovery and reclaiming their African ancestral spiritual practice is not without struggle. As the spiritual retreat director for a group of Black Christian religious leaders, mostly pastors, I prepared the space by creating a large African-inspired altar, including a Dan mask, elements for offering libation, candles, sage, art, and beautiful cloths. It was the Christian Advent season. There were four candles. We gathered in a large circle and offered libation as I asked each person what they wanted to recover from their ancestral roots. One participant, a woman, quietly left the gathering and entered the women's room. This part of the gathering lasted, because of the size of the group, about 45 minutes, and she was gone the entire time. She returned when we were discussing the ritual and each person's experience of it. She told us that she had been afraid to participate because of the mass. Initially hesitant to explain, she finally told us that she had been told by white missionaries of her church that libation and mass were objects of the African continent and were evil and to be avoided. This is the Christianity under which she grew up. As she spoke, she became emotional and even more so when she realized that she had spent her entire life avoiding all things African, including close relationships with most Black Americans. The ritual caused tension in her and began the process of awakening. In another similar instance, a Black mother brought her seven-year-old daughter to a womanist gathering. They arrived early, quite early, and I was preparing the space. I noticed a young girl seemed to watch my every move. As I was about to burn sage, I noticed her leaning forward from the front of her seat. I announced, I need the help of a ritual assistant. And I asked her mother if her daughter could assist. The mother said, yes. And then quickly said, wait, you're not gonna be calling up demons in here, are you? I explained that we were purifying the space and uh, to welcome the, the wisdom of the ancestors. We proceeded and the young ritual assistant entered her spiritual role as if she had been born to it from one generation to the next. Turning black ritual, turning black material life and psyches around requires the retrieval and taking in of the black spiritual wisdom that for some 
was buried during the Middle Passage, for some hidden in the midst of colonizers' cosmology, and for others, simply forgotten. Recovery is the work in Black life, in spiritual practice, and in navigating the multiple spaces where Black embodiment is contested and denied. And finally, a grandmother's ritual. Mrs. Bates, a grandmother, went to pick her grandson, JB, pick him up after school, the first day of school, and discovered that her grandson, who had proudly worn his new cornrows to his Catholic school, was waiting for her in near tears. The principal told her they were unacceptable. Natural hairstyles were forgetting, forbidden. They told the family the braids had to go. JB's grandmother refused, changed his school and filed a lawsuit. The ritual of recovering black children's abused psyches and bodies from the claws of educational imperialism is hard work that needs to be done in every context. In Christian theology, we might understand this work as the ritual work of reclaiming our blackness as being created in the image of God. How do we love black bodies when practices of black hatred, denial, and violence filled ide ideologies, white beauty, white uh, omnipotence are so ingrained in the psyches and the structures of society. JB was entering third grade at his parochial religious local school when he felt the full force of anti-Black embodiment pedagogy. JB as a third grader could effectively and intellectually follow the line of thinking related to his hair. If Black hairstyles are unacceptable, then Black people must be unacceptable. Like Audre Lord, he had to wonder if Black meant bad. Resistance to the infusion of anti-Black sensibilities requires an interrogation of their infliction. JB's grandmother argued this very point. She said, now you're making him feel unacceptable. The fo his photo taken during a press conference revealed a supportive grandmother con comforting her grandson in tears. His emotional response confirmed her apprehension about his feelings. It is safe to say that the principal's behavior, first, he rubbed JB's head as if it was at a demonstration of affection, was actually an imposition of white power. The principal informed Mrs. Bates in one sentence that as the principal, he was the arbiter of what and who is acceptable and that her grandson could not return with his braids. Surely this negatively affected JB, but the embodied ritual moment of his grandmother, a movement made by so many black parents was an immediate counteraction to such psychic violence. There is ritual here. Just leaving the house in the neighborhood to stand in front of this white principal in full view of her grandson required a walking meditation. Thinking of my own mother, I imagined, I imagined giving thought to herself. Notice where you plant your feet. Take a deep breath. Exhale, keep walking. Refute the lie, deep inhale, exhale. Stand flat footed, show how much you love your black grandson. Notice where you plant your feet, keep walking. We need to see and love our black selves, our black usness and our black communities. Historically, Black love has been a foundation upon which the community has structured its ethical principles governing our human relationships. We hear about Black love in the blues, folk tales, the civil rights nonviolent movement, queer movies, Black preaching, and Black studies. 
and they all emphasize the value of black love, black life and black action. In the preface to her classic, Sisters in the Wilderness, Dolores Williams closes with the longing that black women who struggle, quote, who struggle to bring dignity, hope and spiritual sustenance, economic well-being to the everyday lives of black people that in all their giving, remember to love themselves regardless. The love of which she speaks is not the romantic and overly sentimental Sherrod passing as entertainment in our media driven culture. This love is ethically principled, inspires conviction, courage and fuels social action. Black love reminds us of the need to bring a loved self to our communities and commitments. Such a love moves in and towards the communal. It rips back the claws of death dealing ways because it says in the midst of COVID-19 and the wreckage and grief it is leaving in black and brown lives, in the midst of violent brutality against black bodies and communities, we will love ourselves our black flesh regardless. In her essay on love and violence, Emily Towns writes, love is one more piece to the fabric of the universe. One more sign that the Emmaus road is not the end of the journey, but it is the beginning. It is a vital part of our journeys. This love is not limited by the immediate, the past or the even the imagined future. This love, this black love is the thread that connects us, runs through us across time, space, oceans, and cosmologies. This black love links our lives to blackness and black people across the diaspora. Monica Roberts, the author of the Transcrio blog site, no longer with us, wrote that she had an obligation to bring all Black trans people's narratives from across the diaspora to light because, quoting Gwendolyn Brook, we are each other's magnitude and bond. When Black women enter ritual process, we enter it with the moral obligation to reach into all the spaces in need of transformation and healing. The process reshapes the interior in relationship to the self and to the world, but it requires an arduous engagement with the past that is in the present. On some level, we who are Black Americans or African Americans, people of the Black diaspora know that we have grief work, mourning work, lamenting work. We often avoid it in social communal spaces. Why? Because it's painful. We know it is important and crucial. We can trace grief, mourning, and lament in our literature, our music, and art forms. We can also trace our resistance to the principalities and powers that inflict suffering, causing much of our grief and mourning. In an article written some years ago, Rituals of Resistance in Womanist Worship, Dolores Williams writes that ritual can dismantle systemic racism, sexism, and heterosexism. The very embodiment of ritual and the planning entailed is a laying on of hands, a loosening of black women's tongues. In rituals of res resistance, there is a liturgical intent, a form of pastoral care an effort toward interior transformation, but always a call to social activism. Linda Parrish and Orlando Patterson teach us that rituals are intertwined, embedded in the prophetic resistance to white supremacy. Wherever and everywhere, they are a protest against the Christianity preached by white supremacists, that that form of Christianity that pray to the God on high for mercy and love and forgiveness while selling black bodies, sending death into whole peoples, obliterating ancient languages and rituals into forgetfulness. 
but the ancestors gathered in the dark to, to do the practice, the protest rituals in the form of the ring shout, prayers, songs, litanies, and testimonies. These two are tools of resistance and forms of womanist care because they resist, they resist. They resist structural and systemic forces. They gather the living and the ancestors, the one and the whole black communities to name their suffering, to be embraced by the community and God. We light candles, we burn sage, we learn to read and run by the light of the moon and return to sit at countertops, vote, march, get into good trouble, get elected, occupy legislative plazas, be, become holy black peoples because we are images of the divine. Beloved Toni Morrison told us too, there's a choir in the background that shouts and sways, chanting in harmony with baby Suggs, call and response. You know the words, yonder they do not love your flesh, they despise it, but a choir of voices, us, we, them, tremble and rise up in a litany. Someone bellows, yonder they do not love your flesh, but here in this place, we flesh. All of us would respond. Flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in the grass, and then the charge. Love it, love it hard. Ritual reminds us that the image and incarnation of the holy, the you and the I am, collectively and individually, are in us three deep vows to all around. Again, Linda Parrish reminds us that in ritual, incarnation and Imago Day is being realized because we resist, 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 resist state sanction obliteration and dismemberment. If we were in the same place right now, public and free of pandemic overload, I would have us join together. I would rise as I read from Sister Parish, womanist rituals of resistance utilize postmodern womanist reimagining. You would respond, ritual invites communities to discern experiences that are destructive and those that inform and help us emancipate ourselves. I would raise my arms and say, and transform the present and future of this whole holy body. The drummers would begin as we together would proclaim. These rituals bring creative disruption. These rituals need old clay into redemptive reconstruction. These rituals are embodied. These rituals are holy, sanctioned, womanist celebration and communal wholeness. And all the other elders would remind us, our ritual is to transform and heal. Let us remember the ancestors' practices. Let us remember the ancestors' practices. I have relatives who search for alternative ways to address the madness. This is what Rachel Harding and her mother taught us. The internal work, the work of psych psychical healing is important in the creation of individuals, families, and communities from generation to generation, from generation to generation. Let me say this calling on Sanbalfu Somme. Ritual allows us to connect with the self, the community and the natural forces. Rituals help us remove blocks between us and our true spirit. 
Virtual is powerful because it gives expression and form to the reality. The reality we must face, but and the reality that we demand. Let me end here. And what I would say is listen. The ancestors are calling, telling us it's time, it's time, it's time, it's already time. Their voices are rising, directions becoming clear. Meet at all the borders, north, south, east, and west, inside and outside. It's time, light your sage, purify your heart, recall your vows, know your teaching, strengthen your soul. A shout is coming, it will awaken you. Thunder will guide you, courage will free you. The answers, ancestors will hold you. Listen, thank you. Would you join me, fellow listeners, in thanking Dr. Shepard for that powerful uh, message that she shared with us by putting something in the chat, hands, raise, claps, whatever. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. Um, thank you for inviting us to resist and to use ritual in that process. It is a privilege to introduce to you our two respondents this evening. And I'd like to share, to remind those of you who are uh, watching that if you have any questions, please place them in the chat. We will get to them after our two respondents um, share. Would like to welcome Dr. Reverend Dr. Kirsten O uh, to this occasion this afternoon. Uh, Dr. O is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. She has a PhD in practical theology, pastoral care and counseling. She's a professor in the Department of Practical Theology at Azusa Pacific University. Among her scholarly interests is a focus on the intersection between narrative theology and narrative therapy. Prior to joining the faculty at APU, Professor O was the Associate Dean of Students, Student Life here at Claremont School of Theology. Her hobbies include music, reading, swimming, hiking, and traveling. She's married to Scott Russell and they have a wonderful daughter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. O. We'd also like to welcome to this space, Dr. Nicholas Greer. A native of Atlanta, Georgia, Professor Nicholas Greer is an ordained minister in the Progressive National Baptist Convention, a community leader, public scholar, therapist, and musician. He's an associate professor of practical theology, spiritual care and counseling here at Claremont School of Theology and a counselor at the Bishop Wellness Center at Willamette University, and also the founder and CEO of Coloring Mental Health Collective. In his writing, speaking, counseling, and community leadership, Professor Greer privileges the experiences of the most vulnerable and marginalized people in society. In his downtime, he enjoys sports, listening to jazz, playing the piano, dancing, and spending time connecting with nature and with friends and family. So Dr. O and Dr. Greer, we invite you to share your responses to Dr. Shepard. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if we decided who would go first or second. Uh, did you want to go first, Dr. O, or? Um, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I would love to hear you first. Um, I will go first um, because I want to listen very carefully to your response to Dr. Shepard. Um, so I'll go first. All right. Well, thank you to President Kwan and the CSD community, and in particular, Dr. Lincoln Galloway, for the invitation to join this panel. It is my honor and privilege to respond with Dr. Nicholas Greer to Dr. Phyllis Shepard's paper on rituals, resistance, and love in the struggle for justice, a womanist meditation. Before I begin, allow me to locate myself with, uh, before my response. I am a Korean American who immigrated to the US as a nine-year-old. 
I enter the conversation today in my search for siblings of choice during this time of double, no triple pandemics of COVID-19, racism, and hate. I entered this conversation as a daughter of a Korean American elderly couple, a sister to a female clergy, and an aunt to two teenage Korean American high schoolers, and a mom to a mixed race daughter. So when hearing Dr. Shepard speak, I resonate not only with my mind, but also deep within my heart, my emotions, and my body. I recall their presentation at the 2019 AAR Psychology, Culture, and Religion session in which she introduced the attendants to one of her rituals and spoke the prophetic words of the ancestors over us. The same one that you heard today when she ended it with the listen part. I had read through and reread those words on her paper just to feel the sense of hearing um, and the urgency of healing. So thank you, Dr. Shepard, for those powerful words. I have to admit <laughs> that I envy Dr. Shepard in a sense because the Korean women I know personally are all immigrants whose roots in the US um, are, or whose roots are deep in their mother country, but are still forming their branches in this strange land. The expressions are diverse and unformed as our immigration history is relatively short. Korean women, mothers and grandmothers, daughters and granddaughters, I know, but I know no great grandmothers around me. Yet since then, I have become ever so mindful that I follow a long, enduring civic engagement and social and political activism, work of solidarity, as well as decades and generations of on the ground engagement of other Asian American female trailblazers. For instance, Yuri Kochiyama, a revolutionary civil rights activist who threw forced incarceration as a girl of Japanese descent during World War II helped define American active activism by her advocacy for inner city children in Harlem. She had a deep friendship with and later held the head of the dying Malcolm X. Patsy Mink was the first woman of color in Congress in 1964, despite being told that women should stay home to care for their children. She was one of only eight women in Congress at that time and her advocacy against gender discrimination and sexual harassment in education led her to be uh, one of the two principal authors and sponsors of the Title IX bill. Matsie Hirono, the first elected female senator from Hawaii, the first Asian American woman elected to the Senate in 2013. And then lastly, Grace Lee Boggs, American academic and author and social activist who brought together diverse communities to rebuild Detroit in the 1970s and became a key figure in the Asian American movement with five influential books. These names are not the ones that you would hear in the US public schools. As US history for the most part is taught from a majority lens that doesn't account enough for the accomplishments and contributions from communities of color. And even solidarity between Black and Asian Americans that stretches back decades go unmentioned in these history books. For instance, who has ever heard the story of the Black civil rights activists like the Reverend Jesse Jackson and the leaders of the NAACP who showed up and raised the profile of the 1982 death of a 27-year-old Detroit man, Vincent Chen, whose murderers were later charged under the civil rights law. 
recently, I presented on a panel at the Society of Christian Ethics, wherein I spoke on the deforming effects of Asian American evangelical Christianity that most Asian American parents ascribe to and the Christian white evangelicalism on sexuality and gender of Asian American youth. My friend and colleague, Dr. Reggie Williams was one of the respondents and mentioned the notion of genre. It is whiteness that organizes an ideal archetype of being, a, an oppressive norm, some European form as the universal norm from um, the phobia of losing its centrality. It's an ideal archetype of being what is acceptable and palatable presence. What is our relationship with the genre? In order to avoid the white gaze, Asian Americans have benefited with the model minority trope and hope to be white adjacent. But what became clear during the COVID pandemic is that we will never be an acceptable and palatable presence, so long as we are the perpetual foreigners. Viet Nguyen, a professor and author, writes in an op-ed, quote, the basis of anti-Asian racism is that Asians belong in Asia, no matter how many generations we have actually lived in non-Asian countries or what we might have done to prove our belonging to non-Asian countries if we were not born there. Pointing the finger at Asians in Asia and Asians in non-Asian countries has become a tried and true method of racism for a long time in the US. It dates to um, the 19th century. Asian Americans have endured historical injuries in the US like the Chinese massacre in 1871 in the streets of the very city that I live in, Los Angeles. It is now Los Angeles Union Station and it is one of the biggest one-time lynching in the US history. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Yellow Peril myth of the 20th century also displayed the various racialized xenophobic rhetoric and policies. And there are too many of these to name, so I will skip those. In this presentation, Dr. Shepard utilizes rituals, resistance, and love as a formidable way to relate with the genre of educational imperialism and Christianized forms of colonialism. What particularly caught my attention is the ways in which rituals, resistance, and love have the power to interrogate the whitewashing that leaves bereft the interiority from internalized racism and internalized misogyny. Living within the larger framework of neoliberalism, Eurocentric colonialism, I wonder, with the writings of Maladoma Somme, what is pain? And could pain be good? It indeed is painful to recognize, interrogate, and tra transform the cognitive and viscerally learned helplessness and the limping along life resultant of the white supremacy's production of knowledge. I realize here, as I have before numerous times, that although we are differently racialized, and our axes of relating with the genre is thereby necessarily entirely distinct. We black and brown and yellow and red bodies do have shared struggles of being in this liminal space. Perhaps pain can create a collective and collaborative resistance to the evils of racism and hate. As we occupy this in-between, this space of non-belonging, this space where we are at once invisible, yet hyper-visible 
depending on the socio geopolitical and cultural time space context. I wonder if this space might be useful. Could this fugitive space provide areas of collaboration? If ritual is always about the presence and use of power, and it is how Black women simultaneously embody cultural and spiritual power, according to Alice Walker, and if ritual can shake a person free from the rigidity of that part of the ego that wants to limit growth and experience, and if it is also the crucible where this transformation and healing occurs, according to Same, then can women of color together in the United States create communities of healing spaces together? I want to end this response with one of MLK, uh, Martin Luther King's quotes. Quote, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education, unquote. And with that quote, I wanna thank Dr. Shepard for providing that education to us today and provoking critical and character forming thoughts and hopefully collaborations in the days, weeks, months, years to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. O. It's always a privilege to be in conversation with you. So thank you for your excellent uh, remarks. Uh, and for Professor Shepard, uh, who uh, was actually on my uh, dissertation uh, committee when I was a PhD student, uh, it was wonderful to come full circle to be in conversation with you in this moment. And um, I've always valued um, your um, the ways in which you model uh, men mentoring as well as uh, scholarship and, and teaching. So I um, really appreciate the ways in which uh, you continue to uh, contribute uh, to the work in which we, we do. Um, I've got three different uh, main points I wanted to reflect on in response to uh, Dr. Shepard's uh, talk with us today. Um, first, uh, you, Dr. Shepard, you drew upon religious texts as religious as resources for Black women's liberation. Um, it, it seems to me that religious uh, texts have significant power um, in and, and often over people's lives. Um, uh, so, you know, even if people don't interrogate their religious beliefs, uh, religious texts, you know, have a significant function, you know, in society and in, um, in the individuals' lives. For instance, you know, even if a person um, does not self-identify as religious, uh, you know, when a person takes an oath of office, uh, they often, you know, place their hand on a Bible um, or another religious text. Uh, I, I can think about when I practice therapy, um, I often hear, you know, black women um, and other reference religious texts as roadmaps for, um, for their lives. So, so I appreciate the way that you reference religious texts in your lecture. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, what do you see as the value of engaging religious texts um, as a resource for liberation, um, particularly in the lives of black women? Um, the, the second point of reflection I wanted to name was that of rituals. So, so you name rituals as the place and use of power. Um, so, so the value and, and power of ritual, a ritual seems seems clear uh, to me. Um, it, it seems cl clear that um, perhaps part of our next steps from your lecture is to uh, engage in a routine practice of, of rituals. Um, um, and for clergy leaders and spiritual caregivers to uh, resource existing rituals and perhaps um, develop new ones um, that are healing and nurture justice, wholeness, and freedom. Uh, so as we engage in this important work, I I'm wondering about the systemic uh, implications of ritual. Uh, so, so in your work, uh, you've reflected on systematic and cultural transformation um, as an important part of a theory of change. Um, so, so, so I wonder if you see ritual as more about um, interior and communal transformation within, for example, Black women and the entire Black communities, 
um, so that they have power and support to, um, as almost like a force uh, to help them to um, live well and to nurture justice and dismantle um, the systemic forms of oppression. Um, further, what might be transferable from the rich wisdom um, and the resource of ritual, um, particularly for those who might not engage in the practice of um, ritual. Um, for example, um, I I'm teaching a, a critical race theory and the law class at the uh, Willamette University uh, College of Law this semester. And many of those law students are actually here with us uh, tonight. Um, and, and I wonder um, how might ritual um, be a resource for the transformation of, for example, um, the legal system and political and the political system, um, systems which uh, necessarily affect the lives of so many uh, Black people. And the third piece I wanted to name was um, interior transformation. Um, obviously, as uh, therapists, perhaps we have um, you know a, an interest in this <laughs> part of reality. Um, I, I think about the experiences of uh, you know people in my uh, clinical practice over the years, certainly those who are systemically and marginalized, um, you know, for the various intersecting realities. And I, I think about the importance of drawing from their strengths, um, you know, instead of using a deficits model, right, but to use a strengths-based model. Um, so the importance of engaging that model for them to survive, um, seek healing and experience a liberation. Yet, um, it seems clear to me that the challenges of uh, transformation is significant um, in, in people's lives. Um, so, so I often find myself uh, disappointed um, that the environments in which um, Black women live are too often not conducive um, for their flourishing. And, and so I think about the, the struggle that is often present in dismantling um, various forms of oppression, even the various various forms of oppression that might be internalized uh, within people. So uh, given these realities, uh, can you speak more about the nature of interior transformation and, and the place of ritual um, in interior transformation? Um, such as, you know, what is the importance of interior transformation and how can uh, we cultivate it in, in such a way that's life life giving for um, the lives of um, people in our community. Thank you, Dr. Greer and Dr. O for your responses. Would like to invite Dr. Shepard to respond to um, both presentations as well as the questions that Dr. Greer played. Um, gave us. And remind those of you who are watching on the panel, please place any questions that you might have in the chat as well so that we can address those to Dr. Shepard. Mm. Thank you both for your um, engagement with the ideas in the paper and um, with, gener with generosity and challenge and um, um, invitation. Um, uh, let me start with um, Dr. O's. Um, I, I love the way you sort of did that genealogy. Um, I call it a genealogy, lineage, legacies. Um, and I think that part of the work that we're doing, that kind of ritual of naming the names, that's why I kept saying that, because if we don't name the, know the, if we don't name the names, not only do we not pass on the names from one generation to the next, those who think there are no names continue to not know the names. And that, that only serves to reproduce whiteness and its white supremacy and its practices. So that's one thing. And the, the question you ask about, can pain be good? I don't think pain is ever good but I think the engagement of our pain is necessary. And if there's a goodness, it is that through the engagement, we are freed. And through the engagement, we are able to um, have practices of allyship because we recognize um, similarities and sometimes exact similarities. But I think it also, um, heightens our capacity to be empathic. And by empathic, 
Um, I don't, you know, we often hear walk a mile in someone else's shoes. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. Um, one way I would put it is that, that in hearing the narratives of oppression and suffering from others, that not only would we recognize the similarities, but that we would recognize the distinctiveness and care that we'd give a hoot about it. That's what real empathy is, is that, um, uh, well, you gave the example of um, Jackson um, and the NAACP, you know, um, engaging um, the struggle around Mr. Chin's death, uh, murder. To me, that's a form of empathy that is, that is beyond looking for me in your pain, but actually is recognizing both also the distinctiveness and making that my concern. So, so engaging the pain that's inflicted on us will do that. I probably would not go so far to say that pain is good because I think um, it, it is in danger of those theologies of suffering that say that we must suffer um, and, and we must suffer more and more. So, I think we have to be careful of that, um, while at the same time recognizing, um, who was it, Renita Weems, who said um, in a sermon, come out of the cave, uh, basically she said, one thing life has taught me, there's going to be struggle. There's going to be pain. Um, she said more, of course, and more powerfully and more beautifully. But the fact is, if we get up in the morning if we're blessed to get up in the morning, put our shoes on and walk out the door, we're going to encounter pain. This leads me to um, Dr. Greer's comment um, about interiority and how important it is. Um, I think interior transformation has one primary aim, and that is, is that when we get up and walk out the door in the morning, we encounter pain, we recognize pains and pain in others, it leads us to do something about that pain. And not just for our benefit or my community's benefit, but recognizing the um, systemic connections that, that bind us together. Back to Gwendolyn Brooks' um, poem, we are each other's bond. Um, I think it's possible, and I think you were hinting at this, and that is, it is possible, and we see this in a lot of psychoanalytic theories, of course, and practices, to be so focused on the interior that we act as if the social and the systemic is a product of the interior, if that makes sense. In other words, that um, the interior created the external forces that are you know, has someone's knee on my neck. So that, that we, have, we have to challenge our discourse around interiority. But at the same time, um, I've said this someplace else, that to ignore the interior is um, to deny the humanity of the interior that we're, uh, you know, avoiding the interiority of. But what it also does is it means that, um, that there are many people who think I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I, I'm not anti whatever, because I'm not physically doing something to someone as if the way in which the forces and principalities work don't inflict. Right. Yeah, suffering and pain. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, I think of, um, Christian, what you said about, uh, I think you began by saying I'm jealous because most of the women that I know, you don't know great, great grandmothers. And I mean, I mean, it's an interesting way to um, conceptualize that, but it's a reality. It, it's a reality. And I think about a class I taught mobilizing for justice and we went to, um, Ohio, and I'm going to forget where, but um, you know, where you can go in and you can have your ancestry, you can sit down and you know what I'm talking about, the number of stu black students who found out information about their family from that experience. 
I hadn't expected that to have such a profound, hmm. such a profound impact on them. But we need to name names. We need to know who we are. And I want to get to this um, question about the value of religious texts. Um, there are some days, many days, that I think all texts are religious texts. And that our job is to find out what religious texts are operative in the space where we are and use those texts, whether it means we interrogate them or um, we accept them, whatever, however we're using it, for the liberation of those for whom those texts are meaningful, for those for whom the texts are essential. So, I mean, I, I give an example um, when I was early in my clinical training and um, an African-American man was referred to me um, by a clinical director, primarily because he was African-American and I'm African-American and surely that was a perfect match. <laughs> And the guy came in, I always say he came in with the Bible this big. Mm. It wasn't that big, but I was in a psychoanalytic, you know, I was at the center where this idea of somebody bringing the Bible in for therapy. And I was thinking, mm -mm, I'm psychoanalytic. We're not, we're not doing anything with that Bible. Um, it only took him six sessions to realize that anybody who can at least be curious about what I'm doing with the Bible does not need to be my therapist. He did not put it that way, but um, and it took me many years to realize that because of the way I had learned um, the theories of change, um, I couldn't be curious about what the Bible meant to him. Now he was what we might call, um, you know, he was committed to the text as it would be. He wasn't interested in inter interrogating it, but nor was I interested in interrogating my response to it. I mean, we might even say it was a bit phobic. So um, religious texts, I think, are important, but we have to be willing to recognize religious texts however they emerge, however they're being used. Um, and I think that um, just because someone says a religious text is important doesn't mean that the text is important. Like you said, people put their hand on the Bible and make all kinds of oaths, et cetera. And we know that during, um, just before the Civil War started that um, the folks preaching about enslavement, those who were abolitionists and those who were wanting to keep slavery preached the same texts, came to different conclusions. One of the things I, I see our work and I see ritual as a, space to do this, but is to create minds that interrogate everything. Now that, that can be burdensome, but interrogate everything. I like to reference my mother who never prevented us from watching anything we wanted on television, especially this is um, my great hair gives it away, but you know, the Cowboys and the Indians and we, we want to watch John Wayne. She didn't say we couldn't watch John Wayne. What she would do, and I think it was strategic, or maybe it just drove her crazy at this point, she'd be watching and then John Wayne, right at the point where, you know, like he's just going to kill everyone, she, that's when she would intercept and she'd say, I hope you know that's not true. I hope you know that your great, great grandmother is Cherokee. I hope you know. And here you are, you're trying to watch the movie and she's interrogating while you're like going like this. She intercepted that. That is, um, that is what I think should happen with our interiorities. Not that we're going in there trying to do excavation work, but that we, we hold up a mirror to reality because you know, people have commitments to what, what they believe. Interrogate, interrogate. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Shepard. Dr. O, Dr. Greer, please join me in hand claps, comments in the chat. Um, I was sitting here taking notes and I was also trying to stay engaged. And um, just thank you for inviting us to continue the resistance and to use ritual as a process. Um, 
I'd like to take this time to extend our thanks and words of gratitude to the persons who have given so much to make our MLK celebration such a success. First, I offer thanks to Professor Phyllis Isabella Shepherd for graciously accepting our invitation to be our featured speaker this year. Professor Shepherd met with students this morning at 1145 for conversation. And this evening, she engaged us in a very profound and challenging study of rituals, resistance, and love in the struggle for justice, a womanist meditation. I'd like to also thank Dr. Professors Kirsten O oh and Nicholas Greer, who engaged the lecture with their own insight, wisdoms, questions, and probing to expand our knowledge and imagination. I felt like a fly on the wall in this master class and this engaging conversation that you all um, reflected to us today. So thank you. I want to also thank all the participants in this evening's celebration, President Kwan and the President's Office, especially. Maria Iannuzzi, Acting Dean Andy Dreitzer, Courtney Stanton for the poem during our moment of centering. Dr. Galloway, who read our poem. I'd like to also thank those who are behind the scenes. I'd like to recognize our new worship coordinator, Reverend Mona Lisa Lolea, whose work was visible in all the slides. Our new intern Dean of Students, Reverend Alicia Glaze, who coordinated this morning's conversation with students and all those in the communications department, including Kendra Fredrickson Launi, Wendy Cienfuegos, Tehun Lee, who set up the webinar, and Hyun Jae Lee, who was the host of the webinar. Thanks also to all the students of the Pan African Seminarians Association, PASA, and the faculty advisors. I want to thank Dr. Galloway again for coordinating us and pulling us all together for this 44th annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration at Claremont University, Claire, Claremont Students School of Theology. And I also want to thank all of you who gathered here this evening. I say on behalf of all the student organizations and the entire CSD community, we appreciate your presence and we thank you for being here and choosing to join the conversation and our MLK celebrations. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you Thank soon to be Dr. Brooks. <laughs> good to see you yes, as always. Yes, yes. It was good to see you and to, to watch the interaction between you and Dr. Dr. Um, Shepard. I was like, aha. Yeah. <laughs> this is how it's done. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I want the three of us to continue in our conversation. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to stop recording at some point, but I, yes. I mean, this is so important. Still important. recording right now. <laughs> 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 recording, yes.